Um, <clears throat> as you have probably heard, uh, Wednesday was a historic day in uh, tax, international tax history and tax treaty history in particular. Uh, the finance ministers and other high level representatives of over 70 jurisdictions participated in the high level signing ceremony for the multilateral instrument here in Paris at the OECD Chateau. Uh, so there were 67 signatories covering 68 jurisdictions. That's because China uh, signed for both itself and for Hong Kong, uh, plus nine more countries uh, signed uh, letters expressing their intent uh, or interest to sign the MLI uh, in the near future, and um, there will be more to come. So <clears throat> this is uh, truly a global uh, instrument uh, with countries from, from all over the world. We will uh, spend the next hour or, or 90 minutes maximum uh, summarizing uh, all the various aspects of the MLI for you. Um, you will all be muted uh, for the duration of the webinar. So uh, uh, even though you may be tempted to speak to us, uh, you will not be able to unmute and do that. But you can send in your questions in writing through either uh, the WebEx chat feature or by email at multilateralinstruments at oecd.org or via Twitter at OECD tax hashtag BEPSMLI. <clears throat> and your questions will be addressed uh, by either myself, Jeff Vanderwalk, uh, I'm the head of the tax treaty, transfer pricing, and financial transactions division here at the OECD. Center for Tax Policy, or by Gita Kotari on my right, who is a senior legal advisor here at the OECD who has uh, done the legal work in relation to the MLI, or by Michael Evers on my left, who is uh, in the treaty unit here and has led our effort on the implementation uh, of the MLI this year. So moving along to an overview of what we will cover, uh, we will have five uh, sections to our presentation. The first one is why uh, is there an MLI? Secondly, how does it function? What is its legal nature? Uh, third, uh, the outcomes of uh, the uh, signing ceremony on Wednesday. Uh, fourth, what's next? And then last, uh, we will address uh, questions uh, that have come in uh, from the audience time, time permitting. So with that, I will hand over to Michael to begin the presentation. Thank you, uh, Jeff. So to make a proper start, we, we need to answer the, the question first, why the MLI and the, the multilateral instrument was uh, developed as part of a bigger project, the base erosion and profit shifting project. So what is base erosion and profit shifting? Um, when income tax systems were developed in the late 19th century, um, and tax treaties at the same time, there was an alignment between economic reality and the tax rules. But over time, um, the world changed, the economy changed, while the tax rules, including tax treaties, did not uh, change accordingly, uh, with the result that tax planners could erode the tax bases in high tax countries and shift taxable profits to lower to low tax jurisdictions. And that uh, brought the political leaders of a large group of countries in 2013 to the initiative to start a plan to counter base erosion and profit shifting or BEPS, um, launching a 15 point action plan, um, also targeting issues in relation to tax treaties that resulted in a comprehensive action plan, including recommendations um, to improve bilateral tax treaties. And bilateral tax treaties, so that also first one concluded at the, end, at the end of the 19th century um, are there to avoid double taxation in case of cross-border investments or employees working across the border. But over time, um, these bilateral treaties became vulnerable to abuse. Um, as part of the BEPS project, recommendations were developed to counter abuse and to solve a, a couple of other issues. Now, solving those issues by updating these treaties bilaterally would take decades. Um, to solve that, there is a multilateral instrument that we will cover today, the multilateral instrument that was signed on Wednesday. So what does this MLI do? It implements basically uh, a number of measures into 
treaties um, concluded by treaties already concluded by the signatories to the MLI. We will see who those are later on. Um, but let's first focus on the two main pillars uh, of the MLI when it comes to the substantive measure. First one relates to uh, abuse of treaties. In more particular, um, the concept of treaty shopping. So what is treaty shopping? Well, there are also examples of that on the OECD website, including a video that you see a screenshot of here. You can also refer to the frequently asked questions on our website, in particular number 31, where you will see an example of a scheme explained. What you will see explained there is the situation where a company, let's say company A, established in the Cayman Islands, so no tax jurisdiction, uh, would like to do an investment in, let's say, South Africa, um, or would provide a license to a company in South Africa. In the absence of a tax treaty between the Cayman Islands and South Africa, South Africa can apply its domestic withholding tax rates. It could be, for example, 15% on royalties. However, um, if company A then establishes a ladder box company, another form of a stepping stone in a country that has concluded a tax treaty with South Africa, it uh, could seek to you, obtain the benefits of that, that tax treaty because in the tax treaty, um, the two countries concerned may have agreed on a lower withholding tax rate, for example, 5% on outbound royalty payments. Um, so this would be a structure that is set up by company A um, with the principal purposes or is one of the principal purposes just to obtain the benefits of that bilateral treaty. Now the measures developed in the BEPS package seek to address that issue by, for example, uh, proposing a so-called principal purposes test allowing tax administrations to test the objectives behind the uh, structure concerns. Um, so that is one of the main pillars. And we will see later on that all the signatories to the MLI will adopt this principal purposes test to tackle these kind of structures. That's one pillar, but there's more. Um, if we move on to dispute resolution, another important pillar of the BAPS work, in particular Action 14, for those of you who are familiar with that work, um, there is a minimum standard to improve dispute resolution uh, we will come back to that later, um, but all signatories will improve their dispute resolution mechanisms by adopting provisions that provide for the legal basis for a better dispute resolution mechanism in accordance with the Action 14 standard. But on top of that, um, the MLI also provides for an optional mandatory binding MAP arbitration procedure. And already 25 jurisdictions, as we will see later, have opted in for that option, um, introducing uh, an arbitration procedure into existing tax treaties, uh, providing more legal certainty to investors and other taxpayers. So those are um, the main highlights of what the MLI can help to introduce. Um, but before moving on to the adoption of these measures by the various countries, let's have a closer look at the functioning and legal nature of the MLI. And for that, I pass the mic to my colleague, Gita. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so here in this section, I'll take you through uh, what is the legal conception behind the MLI and how does it function in terms of the different provisions in the MLI and their mechanisms. So if we look first at the legal conception behind the MLI, uh, the main reason for doing this, as Michael said, is that it's much faster than bilateral uh, renegotiations of tax treaties. So the concept is that you have one single negotiation, a collective negotiation, which was done in an ad hoc group. Uh, you have one signature uh, by each jurisdiction. So that's what started to happen on the 7th of June. And for each jurisdiction, you would have only one single ratification process rather than a series of different ratifications for different amending protocols. What are the advantages to this? Well, we talked about the efficiency gain uh, represented by having a collective negotiation rather than bilateral. Uh, renegotiations of each treaty. Uh, there are three things to bear in mind. The first is that this is faster. The second is that this will be synchronized, meaning that the changes will be introduced into tax treaties at the same time. And the third reason uh, for doing it this way is that we obtain consistency in the way that the BEPS measures are implemented into the bilateral uh, tax treaties. Now, if we look at how does uh, the multilateral instrument function 
in uh, public international law. It sits alongside uh, the bilateral tax treaties and it modifies their application. So what's important here is that it's not functioning like an amending protocol, which goes and directly amends the text uh, of a tax treaty, but it's sitting together with, it's coexisting. And this is essentially an application of the rule in Article 30, uh, Paragraph 3 of the Vienna Convention, the later in time rule, meaning that a later treaty will supersede an earlier treaty to the extent that there's a conflict between uh, the provisions. So by concluding the MLI, by signing and ratifying the MLI, the treaty partners are consenting to modify the earlier rights and obligations they entered into through the bilateral uh, treaty. An, an important point here is that the MLI doesn't freeze the bilateral treaties in time. The treaty partners are free to go and modify again their bilateral treaties, for example, on other issues not covered by the MLI. Uh, and finally, it's important to note that this may be new in the world of tax treaties, but there are precedents in other areas, including in the area of extradition treaties, where you have a similar system of a network of bilateral treaties, but you have had in the past multilateral treaties which have modified the application of those uh, bilateral treaties. So if we look at some of the key features of the MLI, it was developed in, as I mentioned, an ad hoc group. So that was a self-standing negotiation group, uh, which more than 100 countries and jurisdictions participated in. So this was a truly inclusive process. And as you'll see, we had more than 70 jurisdictions participating in the signing ceremony, but there's a remaining number of jurisdictions which we expect to sign up in the near future. Uh, the MLI, uh, through this legal mechanism, which I just explained, can modify thousands of existing tax treaties uh, in one go. Uh, that number will obviously increase as more uh, countries and jurisdictions join. Uh, the MLI also has flexibility to ac accommodate the different tax treaty policies of different jurisdictions, and we'll look at, at that in a little bit more detail later on. And the MLI will be able to ensure clarity and transparency about the changes made to bilateral tax treaties. And again, we'll look again at the tools and guidance which are being made available uh, for that purpose. Finally, uh, the MLI exists in two authentic languages, that's English and French. Uh, and countries are preparing additional uh, language versions. And again, we'll come back to that in a little bit more detail uh, later on. So if we look at uh, one of the points I just mentioned, which is the flexibility the MLI includes to accommodate different tax treaty policies. The first element of flexibility is the fact that treaty uh, partners can specify the tax treaties which they wish to see covered by the MLI. A tax treaty will only be modified by the MLI if both treaty partners have listed it as an agreement to be covered by uh, the convention. The second element is that where uh, the MLI reflects a minimum standard, it is possible in some cases to meet a minimum standard in another way. And so the MLI allows countries uh, to opt out of a provision reflecting a minimum standard on the basis that they will meet the minimum standard in another way. Thirdly, for anything that's not a minimum standard and not a BEPS minimum standard, it's possible to opt out, and the opt out is done through a system of reservations. It's important to note that reservations apply symmetrically, so if one treaty partner makes a reservation, that provision will not apply even if the other treaty partner has not made a reservation. There are certain exceptions to this in what we call asymmetrical application. There are three uh, examples of that, and you can find, I think, information about that in the frequently asked questions. Um, it's also possible to opt out uh, of an MLI provision for treaties with certain characteristics which are objectively defined in the MLI. For example, it's possible for a jurisdiction to opt out of Article 6, uh, which has a preamble language to be inserted into bilateral treaties on the basis that their treaties already include that language. In those cases, uh, the, the jurisdiction needs to provide a list of the treaties which are covered by that reservation. And finally, the, the last element of flexibility is uh, certain choices that jurisdictions have to apply optional or alternative uh, provisions. And so in those cases, normally the uh, alternative provisions or the add-in provisions will only apply if both uh, treaty partners have chosen to apply them. Again, there are some exceptions uh, to that. The most important opt-in provision uh, in the MLI is part six on arbitration. 
So part six on arbitration will only apply if both treaty partners have chosen to opt in to part six. When you're looking at the MLI provisions, you'll see that they're broken down into different parts, starting with the, the BEPS measure. Uh, you then have certain reservation clauses, and then you come to one of the key uh, features of each MLI provision, which is the compatibility clause. And this is the clause which defines the way in which the MLI provision will modify the application of the bilateral tax treaty. So there are essentially four different kinds of compatibility clauses. You'll see the language sometimes in place of, which means that the MLI provision will supersede an existing provision in a bilateral treaty if there is one. You can also see language in the compatibility clauses, which says that the MLI provision will apply to or modify a, a bilateral uh, treaty provision. This means that the MLI provision changes the application of an existing bilateral tax treaty provision. Thirdly, you have compatibility clauses, which use the language in the absence of, which means that the MLI provision will apply if there is no uh, existing provision in the bilateral treaty. And finally, and this is the majority of cases, the MLI provision applies in the plate in place of or in the absence of a bilateral tax treaty provision, meaning that the MLI provision will always apply whether or not there's an existing uh, provision in the bilateral uh, tax treaty. Uh, just before passing over uh, to Michael for the outcomes of the signing ceremony, a word about the explanatory statement to the MLI in response to some questions we've received. Um, the explanatory statement to the MLI is essentially a, a commentary uh, to the convention. However, it's important to note that the explanatory statement was adopted at the same time as the text of the MLI, which gives it more legal weight in terms of public international law as part of the context of the MLI uh, under the Vienna Convention rather than a supplementary means of interpretation. If you look at the explanatory statement, what you'll see is that it focuses on the functioning of the MLI. So it focuses on the question of how does the MLI modify the application of bilateral tax treaties. For the substance of the BEPS measures, it refers back to the commentary on the BEPS uh, package. And in relation to the commentary on the model uh, OECD model tax convention, the MLI and its explanatory statement doesn't change the status or the legal value of that commentary. Uh, so the situation in that sense is, uh, is the status uh, quo. And then here I hand back to Michael to talk a little bit more about the outcomes of the signing ceremony on Wednesday. Thank you, Gita. So as already became a bit more clear, there was a lot of homework to do for countries. Well, so what we saw on Wednesday was not only a big event where we had indeed a lot of ministerial representatives or other high level representatives, it was also the day, the deadline for countries to um, deliver their so-called MLI position. So we had 67 signatories there, as uh, Jeff already mentioned. Um, and at the time they've also, or by the time they've also delivered their provisional MLI position. Uh, and that is a document that reflects those uh, treaties to be covered, as Gita mentioned, uh, reservations made and options chosen. That's all in a document per jurisdiction deposited to the OECD because the OECD is a depository and also made public. So what you see um, at the right hand side of the slide is a, um, a screenshot of the list that we have on our website, oe.cd slash MLI is a short uh, address for that. You will see the list of the um, signatories and the jurisdictions covered. And for almost all of them, there is a link to the provisional MLI position as deposited um, by Wednesday this week. Now, in a little bit more detail, a look at those numbers. So we already covered the number of signatories and jurisdictions covered. Um, they, as we said, they, they listed uh, many treaties. So most of them started with taking the list of their entire treaty network and then removed some treaties that were already under renegotiation. For the MLI to have an impact on bilateral treaties, of course, it needs to be a match. And if you, you combine the data that we already have on the basis of those MLI positions, we see that there will already be 1,100 plus matched agreements. And the estimate is that there are some uh, 30, uh, 3,500 tax treaties around the world. So we already cover nearly a third of that. And the number will go up quickly as further uh, signatories join. And there will be more joining soon because as Jeff said, there were already 
nine jurisdictions that expressed their intention to sign the MLI either at the ceremony itself or by sending a letter or by posting a message uh, on their website. We had Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, Estonia, Lebanon, Tunisia there um, signing a letter of intent. We had Jamaica, Nigeria, Panama, Mauritius also expressing their intent to sign the MLI. And we can expect that many more will follow because we already know that many more jurisdictions are preparing for signatures and we're actually actively working with them to do the homework that is involved in drafting the MLI position. Now, what else did we see? We take a closer look at those MLI positions. Uh, some of you already uh, went online um, and, and looked at the various MLI positions uh, deposited and published there. Um, if you went through all of them, you will have seen that all of the signatories will indeed apply the principal purposes test. That is the default rule of Article 7, Paragraph 1 of the MLI. Um, Twelve jurisdictions have uh, decided to supplement that um, with a simplified LOB provision. Um, I won't go into the detail what then happens with possible symmetrical or uh, asymmetrical application um, in, in case the other party did not choose the simplified LOB. So we, we can save that maybe for another time. Um, but what we can conclude in any case for the uptake of the Action 6 minimum standard is that um, we will have this principal purposes test as one of the ways to meet the Action 6 minimum standard in those 1,100 plus treaties and more to come. Now, how about the uptake of Action 14? So if we look at Action 14, uh, the first point to note is that we have 44 jurisdictions uh, which will use the MLI to implement a measure which will allow a taxpayer to submit a map case to either uh, competent authority, meaning the competent authority of either jurisdiction uh, to the tax treaty. Um, and another important point on uh, Action 14 and dispute resolution is in relation to mandatory binding map arbitration. Uh, we saw on the 7th of June, 25 jurisdictions opting into part six of the MLI on uh, arbitration. Um, it's important to note that these numbers are provisional because the MLI positions can change up until the point of ratification first. Uh, and second, even after ratification, um, it's possible for jurisdictions to modify the, their MLI positions to accept more of the MLI. So they can't go backwards, but they can accept more. So this, this uh, MLI is a dynamic instrument, meaning that jurisdictions could opt in to, uh, to part six of the MLI into arbitration later on, uh, once they become more comfortable uh, with the process. They can also withdraw reservations which they've made, uh, resulting in the application of an MLI provision as between themselves and their treaty partner. So if we go back to arbitration, we have 25 jurisdictions which opted in. What did they choose? Uh, we have 18 of those 25, which uh, opted for the default uh, option of baseball or final offer arbitration. And we had seven jurisdictions which opted for independent uh, opinion arbitration. Another element in arbitration, which is important for you to know, is that this is the only part of the MLI where it's possible to make what we call free form reservations. For the rest of the MLI, there's a closed list of defined reservations which were concluded as part of the negotiation. On arbitration, it's possible for a jurisdiction to come up with its own list of reservations. So in order to see the scope of arbitration in any given case, it's important to look not only at whether a jurisdiction opted into part six, but also at the list of reservations which uh, they made in order to determine what is the scope of arbitration. Um, and a final point on arbitration, uh, we saw at the signing ceremony on Wednesday uh, several uh, jurisdictions who spoke calling for additional jurisdictions to opt into arbitration in order to expand uh, the network of arbitration and also to expand the scope of arbitration uh, under the MLI. So that's something to watch uh, in the future. And here I'll hand back over to Michael for the question of what comes next. Um, so what comes next? Um, if we look uh, at our work on, on the scale of a timeline, uh, maybe good again to note that uh, all this work so far happened quite quickly, starting the negotiations in 2015, 
um, concluding negotiations in November, and here we are in June after um, already 67 countries and jurisdictions have finalized their procedures to be able to sign. Now, some of them didn't make it because it was also a very tight timeline for them to, to prepare the positions to get ready to sign, to get a governmental approval to sign. So that is also why some of them um, just missed the deadline. Uh, some of them who, who missed the deadline will follow quite quickly. For example, Mauritius expressed that they will sign uh, rather quickly. Others also looked into the options of the MLI vis-a-vis -vis, um, other options to implement the minimum standards like Bermuda, uh, planning to uh, probably follow the more bilateral way, also given the small number of uh, TTAs they have. Um, but all, all overall, I think we will see a significant number of additional jurisdictions signing up in the coming period, at least until the end of the year. Um, the OECD Secretariat will continue to support these countries. Uh, most of them uh, are already in the ad hoc group and we have new countries joining. Um, there was also a question from Ms. Mr. Eggert from KPMG about uh, what does the membership of the ad hoc group mean in terms of signing up? Well, joining the ad hoc group doesn't entail an obligation for jurisdictions to sign up to the MLI. At this point, it is a platform for jurisdictions to um, have technical discussions on their draft positions to to matching and to exchange experiences in preparing the various processes. And through the ad hoc group, the secretariat is also providing their assistance. So no direct obligation for countries, uh, jurisdictions to resign the MLI. Um, so who do we expect to see later in the year? So we already saw those expressing their interest. Um, there will be more to join. There were uh, a lot of developing countries actively engaged in, in a work in the ad hoc group, but their uh, um, procedures, domestic procedures, just took a bit longer and I think they will catch up quickly later this year or otherwise early next year. Um, Maybe I can jump in here, yep. Michael, and <clears throat> supplement your response to Jesse, <clears throat> who we should mention used to work here and uh, invested a lot of time and effort into the MLI and we appreciate that. Um, uh, he also raised the issue of uh, countries that have only adopted the uh, minimum, the two minimum standards uh, from the BEPS projects so far. So the the two pillars that Michael mentioned earlier, the presentation of uh, anti-treaty shopping under Action 6 and the improvements of the MAP procedures under Action 14 are minimum standards that all of the uh, inclusive framework uh, on BEPS and all those countries have committed to do. And uh, some of the signatories to the MLI reserved on uh, everything else. Um, and Jesse uh, asked if we expect many countries that did that took that approach in order to be able to sign on Wednesday uh, will uh, sort of change those reservations and adopt uh, or opt in uh, to uh, other aspects of the MLI, which are optional uh, before they finally ratify in their domestic procedures. Of course, we, we don't know that. We, we hope that countries will because the more uh, BEPS project recommendations are adopted, uh, the more the BEPS project uh, will be having its effect, you know, going forward in, in more and more countries. So uh, we uh, obviously work with countries and we'll be helping countries with their ratification uh, efforts, as uh, we may talk about a little more. Uh, and we hope that there will be expanded take up of the optional provisions as we as we do that. Um, well, maybe that brings us then also to the ratification process in during which there is more flexibility. And I guess Zita can cover that as well. Yeah, so if we think about uh, the stages of the MLI, we have the negotiation, which was a collective multilateral uh, stage in the process. We had the signature on Wednesday. Again, each, each country had to go through its internal procedures, but it was a collective moment for us. And now we move into a different phase in the process for those uh, jurisdictions which signed on Wednesday, which is much more a domestic process. And this is the process for ratifying uh, the MLI. So the way that the MLI has been designed is that each uh, jurisdiction comes up with an open offer to its treaty partners to modify the bilateral treaties as between the two within the limits of the, that jurisdiction's own MLI position. Now, this is an important and slightly uh, complex point, but for a jurisdiction signing the MLI, uh, say jurisdiction A, 
uh, that jurisdiction comes up with its MLI position, which includes a list of covered tax agreements under the MLI. It also includes certain reservations under the MLI. So it's making an offer to all of the treaty partners uh, listed in its list of covered tax agreements to make those modifications, which jurisdiction A has uh, agreed to through the MLI. Now, even if jurisdiction B were to uh, sign up to more of the MLI than jurisdiction A, i.e. to make fewer reservations than jurisdiction A, uh, the only uh, modifications to the application of the bilateral treaty which could be made are the ones where there's a match between the two jurisdictions. So each jurisdiction does remain in control of what kinds of uh, modifications will be made to the application of its tax treaty. Now, this is important because it means that a jurisdiction can go to its parliament to ratify the MLI and would not need to return when a new country uh, joins the MLI. This is the intention behind uh, the engineering of, of the MLI, is that you can have one single ratification. So you may include in your list of covered tax agreements, tax agreements with jurisdictions which have not yet signed the MLI, but you would not need to go back to Parliament when those jurisdictions later uh, join the MLI. Now the domestic procedures for ratification will usually follow uh, the, the standard approach for the implementation of bilateral tax treaties. So that's the starting point. And here it's important to know that the ratification uh, requirement on the international level is the same for everyone. So the MLI will apply as between two jurisdictions when they've deposited their instrument of ratification to the MLI, full stop. That's the answer at the public international uh, law level. However, at the domestic level, there may be different answers depending on each country's uh, domestic system. So there are certain countries which have what we call uh, monis systems where uh, international obligations and rights are directly incorporated into the domestic legal system. You have other countries which use a dualist system, meaning that they have to adopt implementing uh, legislation for their international rights and obligations to take effect. So what we may see is that countries may take different approaches to the domestic implementation uh, of the MLI. And uh, you may see that some jurisdictions will uh, be uh, implementing in their legislation uh, a list of changes which are made to the specific bilateral uh, tax treaties. They may even consult their treaty partners for that purpose. But it's important to note that those uh, initiatives, uh, those actions are not amending protocols at the international level, but rather measures which are taken domestically in order to give effect uh, to the MLI. So if we uh, think about the timeline and when will this MLI have effect, the first question is when does the MLI as a legal instrument enter into force? And the answer to that is that it requires the deposit of the instrument of ratification by at least five signatories. So we need five jurisdictions to deposit their instrument before the multilateral uh, convention enters into force. It has legal existence in uh, public international law. Then when does the second question is when does the MLI enter into force for each of the signing jurisdictions? Well, for the first five jurisdictions, the answer will be linked to the answer to the first question. So once the MLI has entered into force, uh, there will be a period of three months before uh, before the MLI will enter into force for those first five jurisdictions. So for that first group. Then for each signatory which deposits its instrument of ratification after that, the MLI will enter into force after a period of three months. So you'll see a, a staggered entry into force depending on the, the timing of the deposit of the instrument of ratification. The third question in answering, uh, in trying to answer when the MLI will have effect is linked to the entry into effect of the provisions of the MLI. And for that, I hand back to Michael. Thank you, Gita. Yeah, well, this is where uh, it always becomes a little bit more complicated. People who are used to bilateral tax treaties are familiar with, with that because it's not only um, a relevant question when a treaty or in this case modifications become uh, enter into force from a, a legal perspective, but the, the practical questions for practitioners, for tax administrations, when do the measures um, enter into effect, so become applicable in practice. Um, what we see there is um, that the rules can be quite complicated also because there are 
some uh, alternative choices that um, jurisdictions can make. Um, we will cover that also in additional uh, materials that we will have on our website later on. But let's look at the main picture. Maybe the, the short answer to the question as to when will the, the MLI changes enter into effect. In practice, we will see that the first changes we will see uh, entering into effect it will be early 2018. But how, how does it work um, as a main rule? What we see first of all is that there is a split between uh, different types of taxes. So on one hand, we have taxes withheld at, for, at source. On the other hand, as we will see the other taxes, the ones that are linked to a taxable period. Um, that is something you, you might be familiar with from, from existing tax treaties. So you see that typically um, in the entry into force articles of bilateral treaties. Now, um, the for the taxes withheld at source, you will need to look at the um, deposit of the ratification instrument of the two parties to a covered tax agreement. So you look those two up and then you look at the latest of the, the two dates and that triggers automatically the entry into effect. So suppose we have established that the latest entry into force for one of the two parties is the 1st of December 2017. Then for taxes withheld at source, you go to the first day of the next calendar year, so in this case 2018, and the MLI provisions then have effect as of the 1st of January of that year. So for taxable events to which that withholding tax is linked, for taxable periods, for example, um, maybe you have that same starting date as uh, being the 1st of December 2017 for the latest entry into force, you start counting period of uh, six months, and um, then um, the MLI provisions will have effect for taxable periods uh, beginning as of that moment. So in some countries, taxable years actually begin at the 1st of July, so it could be as early as then. In most countries, I guess there's a link with a calendar year for taxable periods for the income taxes, so there you would have to wait to the 1st of January 2019 um, to see these um, measures entering into effect. Now, of course, over the course of time, we hope to have some tracking tools available for, for that uh, to make sure that those, that information is easily accessible. But in any case, everything unfolds relatively automatically uh, from the, the information you would have on the entry into force um, as all the signatories will deposit their instrument of ratification uh, with us, the, the OECD. Um, touching upon clarity anyway, um, on one hand, yes, the MLI is a complex instrument, but bilateral tax treaties are, are already complicated. Um, so what, what can we do to make our lives easier? Um, a lot, and that is what the OECD Secretariat is currently also doing together with the members of the ad hoc group. So one of um, the initiatives we have is the, the launch of an application toolkit. So a toolkit that helps us to apply the MLI uh, in a clear and easy way. There will be several elements to that, and the first ones are already online. Uh, one is a background paper uh, basically explaining more on the legal nature, as Gita also just did orally. Um, there is a step-by-step -step guide on how to apply the, the MLI, so um, um, if you want to put a poster uh, um, next to your bed or next to your desk, this is what you could print. Um, there are also interactive flowcharts that I will show that helps you to see how the matching works. So if you have the information from the two MLI positions of parties to a covered tax agreement, how do the changes then uh, have effect for uh, that bilateral relationship? We will have a look at that. So that's something we already have. We will develop uh, much more. One of the things we're planning to develop as well is a public matching database. So what is that? For the work we've done so far in the group, we already um, developed a matching tool that allowed countries to not only share their draft MLI positions within the group um, in the form of the documents that you've seen published now, but we also process the data into a database to make it easily accessible and to have projections of what would be the li likely matching outcome. So what would be the modification to a bilateral tax treaty? Now, having that as a tool for, for testing purposes internally, something different, obviously, than having that as a public tool. So, of course, it takes more time to develop uh, together with the countries, because countries obviously will need to make sure that the information is accurate so that um, the outside world 
uh, can rely on that to a large extent. So what we might see is the phased um, development and therefore phased release of, of such a tool. So starting with something that basically processes these MLI positions as you've already seen them into a database that it makes all the data easily accessible so that you at least can manipulate already, maybe look up country pairs. Ideally, you would have something that has the, the possibility of the computer predicting what would be uh, the modification to a bilateral treaty. That is actually, as I said, something we have behind the scenes, but that needs more work to develop uh, to be ready for the public. And we will continue to work very hard on that in the rest of the year. But I wanted to go back to um, one of the tools I, I mentioned, those matching flowcharts. So what you then can do is just as I do, uh, grab your mouse. This, you will see here an example of a flowchart uh, for Article 7. Um, that is the, the provision containing the anti-treaty shopping rules and the, main per, the principal purposes test. So what you would then uh, look at are the MLI positions of the two countries you're interested in. And then your question might be, is Article 7 opted out of entirely uh, under one of the provisions that allows that opt out? So let's say no. Uh, and then this way you can, can go um, through um, the MLI position. So let's say there's also no reservation as mentioned here, et cetera. Uh, is there another reservation? No. Um, did they all notify the same provision? Yes, et cetera. So this is something that you can play with at home uh, or in the office um, and to, uh, to get easy access to, um, to the information and to have an easy understanding of the likely matching outcome instead of needing to go through the text of the MLI itself for the analysis of the MLI position. Um, that brings us to one other question that comes up uh, regularly, as that would be the next step on consolidation and also on how to deal with languages. So maybe Gita would like to share something about that with you. Yes, one of the, one of the main questions which we get uh, regarding the MLI is how are, are uh, jurisdictions going to ensure clarity for taxpayers and for their tax administrations on the way in which the application of bilateral tax treaties has been modified uh, by the MLI. And here, uh, one of the tools which can be used uh, in this respect is the production of consolidated versions of bilateral tax treaties showing the changes uh, brought about by the MLI. Now, it's important here to note that consolidation, the creation of consolidated versions is not legally necessary for the MLI to have effect. Uh, so the MLI in public international law will have effect, as I mentioned, as a, a later treaty coexisting with an earlier treaty. So the changes will be made without the need for any consolidated text. However, it could be a very powerful practical tool in order to allow tax administrations to correctly apply uh, the bilateral treaty with the modifications to its application made uh, by the MLI and also for taxpayers to have transparency about uh, the applicable uh, rights and obligations under the uh, tax treaty. So one thing which is important uh, to uh, also to bear in mind and relates to what Michael was uh, saying just now about the matching database is that with the MLI, it is important for uh, the signing jurisdictions to retain some element of control uh, re relating to this process because the MLI doesn't function like an amending protocol. With an amending protocol for one specific tax treaty, you basically have a list of the uh, article and paragraph numbers with the wording to be replaced uh, and the new wording. It's a, it's a straightforward uh, exercise to implement those changes in the bilateral treaty. Here uh, with the MLI, there are some choices which have to be made in implementing uh, the changes to the application of uh, the bilateral tax treaties. And so that's why it will be important for the signing jurisdictions uh, to develop uh, these uh, consolidated versions, or at least to be uh, engaging uh, with uh, this process. Um, then another issue which has uh, arisen is the question of languages. Uh, because we've had several people asking us, well, uh, the MLI exists in English and French. That's all very well for treaties which exist in English and French. But what about treaties that exist perhaps in other languages, in Spanish, in Arabic, uh, in Chinese? Uh, 
Well, uh, it's true that the decision during the negotiation was that we would produce two authentic languages. The reason for this is a practical one. Uh, if you're nego negotiating a multilateral treaty, it's difficult to negotiate in several languages at the same time. At the UN, they do that in six languages with a big team of translators behind them. At the OECD, we work in two languages, in English and French. But the problem shouldn't be overestimated either, because when we look uh, in more detail, we see that 90% of double tax agreements have an authentic version in either English or in French. So the number of tax treaties which are gonna fall outside of that group is relatively small. In those cases, uh, what uh, the signing jurisdictions are doing is they're developing translations of the MLI, and you'll see that we already have some of those translations available on our website. You can see that at the right uh, side of the, of the screen. Um, and other uh, translations will follow. Once you have a translation of the MLI, you're essentially in the same position as if your treaty is in English and French. So you then proceed to apply the MLI to the bilateral uh, treaty. It's important, of course, to bear in mind that if there were to be a conflict between these translations which have been prepared and the authentic English or French versions, it will always be necessary to refer back to the English and French uh, authentic versions which were negotiated and concluded uh, by the ad hoc uh, group. And so with that, I think we turn over to uh, remaining questions. And I see that we've already received uh, quite a few uh, while we've been speaking. Yes, we have uh, a handful. Um, <clears throat> I think the first one that came in um, asked, when will the OECD provide further guidance <clears throat> on the or guidance on the application of the principal purposes test to um, the treaty qualification or benefit uh, entitlement of uh, private equity funds and other non-CIV funds, CIV standing for collective investment vehicle. Um, this uh, is a subject that has been um, worked on by uh, the OECD and Working Party One in connection with um, the inclusion of the principal purposes test in the OECD model tax convention. Um, and we will be publishing an update later this year of uh, the model tax convention and its commentary. Uh, uh, Gita alluded to this earlier in the presentation that the MLI is a separate thing from the OECD model. And the MLI is not a, a product of the OECD Committee on Fiscal Affairs. It's, it's a, a freestanding thing that was produced by the ad hoc group on the MLI. Um, <clears throat> the Model Tax Convention, on the other hand, is a, uh, an OECD product. And um, it includes the BEPS uh, treaty-related measures. Uh, and so the 2017 update of the OECD model convention will have, among other things, the principal purposes test. And the commentary uh, has extensive discussion of uh, the, the attention and interpretation of the principal purposes test. It includes many examples of uh, the application of the test, including three uh, examples on non-CIV funds. And uh, we issued a, our working party one <clears throat> issued a public discussion draft on those three examples uh, in January of this year. Uh, and that uh, gives you know, a very good idea of what the 2017 update uh, commentary will say uh, regarding the application of the principal purposes test to non-CIV funds. Um, another question uh, has come in asking about if a provision is modified by the MLI, um, can the bilateral treaty partners uh, later uh, modify it further through uh, you know, an, an agreement between themselves? I'll turn over to Gita to explain that further. Well, the simple answer to that one is yes, they can. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, the MLI doesn't freeze uh, the bilateral tax treaty uh, in any way, either on the provisions which have been uh, the application of which has been modified by the MLI or on other parts of the bilateral treaty which are untouched by the MLI. So the treaty partners retain their full uh, sovereign freedom to uh, modify the bilateral treaty further. One element uh, which they may wish to bear in mind is that if they're modifying their bilateral treaty on another point, but they do want to preserve uh, the modifications made by the MLI 
it may be useful for them to specify this when they're uh, negotiating the uh, further changes to their bilateral treaty. And I think we'll see practice emerging uh, in that regard as time um, goes on. Thank you. A uh, question came in in relation to the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Um, <clears throat> I guess, uh, Michael, do you want to comment on that one? Yeah, I, we, we have already one of them uh, as a signatory in, in the group, so that's, uh, that's Kuwait. Um, if you look at the list of members of the ad hoc group, you see that there are more, more of them there. Uh, I guess most notably also Saudi Arabia, also G20 countries, so very actively involved in the G20 the project. So um, I think we, we can expect that they will sign later once they have also um, finalized their internal procedures for signature. Um, you will see on the list as well countries like the UAE um, that is also um, uh, working on, on the uh, preparation for, for the MLI um, and more will, uh, will likely follow later on. Okay, and then there's a fairly detailed uh, question um, about the particular countries, and I'm not sure we want to uh, get into these details here on the on the presentation. <laughs> it might be better to get back to the questioner separately after we've had a chance yeah. to properly digest the question and uh, think about the technical application. Oh, I see we have some more now. We have some more. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so one question is, um, what about countries that have applied the MLI only to some of their uh, bilateral treaties uh, and have excluded a significant number of their treaties uh, from the application of the MLI? Um, I will leave that to either of you to address if, as you like. Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, um, as, as we said, uh, most countries actually started to their preparation of the MLI position with looking at their full list of, of treaties and then identify those that were already uh, in under renegotiation or maybe ones that already met the minimum standards because they were concluded fairly recently. But there may also be other um, considerations for countries not to list all their, their treaties. Um, some of the countries did not have not finalized their full assessment of their treaty network. Again, there is full flexibility for countries to um, extend the list. In any case, the entire MLI position is flexible until the deposit of the instrument of ratification. But also after that, it is possible to um, uh, add treaties to the list of treaties to be covered. Uh, on the other hand, we should also note that there, uh, the MLI is just one of the means to implement the minimum standards and the other BEPS measures. We will have um, um, countries, of course, continuing also bilateral negotiations. Um, considering the fact that many of the signatories and um, are already members of the inclusive framework on BEPS uh, or will become a member of that framework, um, they will have committed to the minimum standards in any case. So there, uh, one way or another, um, they, they will be involved in, in the peer review process. Um, for example, on action six that will start next year, the terms of reference are online, or the minimum standard on action 14, the peer review process that has already started. So um, one way or another, uh, countries, at least the ones in the inclusive framework, will seek to implement uh, these measures of the, the BEPS package. That's right. That's worth mentioning that um, the the BEPS project commitment to the inclusive framework countries applies regardless of whether they mm -hmm. have chosen to sign the MLI. Uh, the notable case of a country whose position is that they already satisfy uh, the minimum standards uh, related to treaties, at least, uh, is the United States. Uh, so, you know, they will be peer reviewed just like every other country to check all of their treaties to make sure that they satisfy those minimum standards, but they're not doing it through the MLI. Uh, they uh, believe they've already done it. And if to the extent they haven't, they have a commitment to do whatever they need to do uh, to fully comply with the minimum standards going forward. And in relation to Switzerland, you may want to have a look on our website where we have the list of MLI positions. We also have a link to a statement which was made by Switzerland uh, committing also to, to implement the minimum standards through bilateral renegotiation if the treaties are not covered by the MLI. Okay. Um, 
question about Brazil uh, because it was in the ad hoc group that developed the MLI. Uh, can we expect it to sign the MLI? As Michael explained earlier, uh, participation in the ad hoc group did not uh, entail <clears throat> a commitment uh, to sign the MLI, uh, but of course we hope they will. Um, uh, we, um, you know, can just uh, stand by to help them with any uh, assistance they may need from us in their process of uh, looking at it and deciding when and whether and how to uh, adopt the MLI. Other questions coming in? Yeah, I see there is also an interesting question from uh, Mr. Francisco Zamora, Zamora sorry, uh, asking about um, publication of the positions of the countries, whether the OECD will be editing a book. That's an interesting question. Uh, as, as you uh, have, have understood from our prestige, our ambitions are, ambitions are a, bit, a bit bigger than that. And also, again, we need to uh, remind ourselves of the fact that this instrument is also flexible in time so that positions will change under the, the limitations uh, explained earlier. Um, so it will be something dynamic. So I guess it will be something online uh, and what we will be developing are more of those tools that we already explained. So it's not, uh, since it's 2017, I think it will all be uh, online. Okay, we have a question about arbitration. Um, <clears throat> what would happen if uh, treaty partner countries both opt into mandatory binding arbitration, but uh, do not choose the same type of arbitration? Um, that may get technical, but I offer it to either of you to answer that. Uh, that that's, that's indeed it, it, a little bit technical here. You see um, that that is depending on the interaction of uh, the, the various rules. So um, let's let's go then in a little bit into that detail of Article 23 in this uh, this regard, because Article 23 of the MLI defines the, the, the two types of arbitration that we already referred to. So we have a default rule. Um, that is the so-called last over arbitration. That was the baseball thingy we saw. Um, countries that do not like that type can make a so-called reservation. They do that under Article 23.2, and they um, then will um, not apply the default option, but would, would apply the so-called independent opinion type of arbitration. We saw that also that some of the countries do that. Now. The next layer of flexibility is the option for countries that would not want to agree on independent opinion arbitration could also make a reservation against that form of arbitration. Um, what would happen in that case? Um, in principle, nothing until they found another solution that's also described in that article. Um, they would then discuss bilaterally what uh, kind of arbitration they would like. They could come up with something, to something totally different, mm -hmm. or they could decide after all to go for one of the two options and implement that accordingly. But they do have an obligation to make their best endeavors to reach agreement on a, a different type of arbitration. I saw a follow-up question on, on guidance um, uh, asking, in addition to the guidance on principal purpose test for non-CIV funds, whether there would be guidance on the um, redefined uh, dependent agent PE and specific activity PE uh, definition in Article 5 of the Model Tax Convention, which is an optional provision in the MLI. And the same answer is the same. The um, 2017 update of the model and its commentary will include uh, the material from the BEPS uh, project final reports. So uh, the final report on action seven related to PEs includes quite a bit of commentary uh, on the new uh, defining uh, provisions in uh, paragraphs four, five, and six of article five of the model. So those, uh, parts of that action seven final report will be in the updated commentary that is published later this year. Okay. Um, someone's asking where they can see the country list and we've already, we've already posted. Yeah, that, so right? maybe, yeah. maybe just to explain it one minute, we have two web pages online. The landing page, as we call it, that is um, a very short email, a short uh, address, oe.cd slash MLI, that brings you to uh, the page, which also has a link 
uh, to a PDF document that has all the signatories. The document is always up to date. It always men it also mentions the those jurisdictions that have expressed their intent to sign the MLI, and it also brings you to the MLI positions to the extent we have published them. Okay, thank you, Michael. I think um, that that exhausts the questions we received about the MLI. Um, uh, we are happy to, um, you know, take further questions. Uh, that's what we're here for. Um, <clears throat> we will also be making this uh, webinar available on our website. It'll be available uh, by uh, early next week, and um, you can watch it as many times as you like. <laughs> Um, and uh, later this month, probably on the 26th of June, the OECD will be uh, doing another uh, webinar. It's um, the tax work here at the Center for Tax Policy and Administration uh, more generally. So look, uh, look out for that in your uh, notices that you get uh, from the OECD. And with that, I'll thank Gita and Michael and uh, wish you all a very good day. Thank you. Thank you.